Welcome back to the Smoking Steak Podcast. This is episode 66 of the world's only English language podcast, all about Brazilian football. I'm your host, Peter, joined as always by Enric, uh, and we are joined by a third today as well. Uh, we have Eduardo Bisbo in the house. He Eduardo's a sports journalist uh, from Brazil. Uh, he went to uh, one of our local schools, Oakland University. He's a commentator for the Brasileirao play in English, and he's the founder of Detroit Media, named after the city that Enric and I uh, uh, reside in now. Uh, so welcome, and thanks so much, Eduardo Visvo. How are you? I'm doing great, guys. Thank you. Honored to be here. This is such an important podcast for everyone that works with soccer in Brazil and works it uh, with English in English as well. So honored to be here, honored to talk to you guys, and uh, it's going to be great. And we let's also say hi to Enric. Enric, how are you doing, man? I'm doing really amazing and very happy to have uh, you, Eduardo, here with us today in order to learn more about your background and uh, also, your background as a normal person and uh, as a fan of, of of the beautiful game. So, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. It's so great to be here talking to you. Finally, meet you. We've been <laughs> talking back and forth, talking in in person per se is great. Yeah, I really like this too. And we had a chance to talk to one of your friends, Marisa Destri, and hopefully many of them in the future, just like you. <laughs> so just kind of getting started, we're going to first talk about your life. And what was interested to know, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Sure. I grew up in a, a small town really close to Sao Paulo that belongs to Metro Sao Paulo. It is like a neighborhood of... of uh, the city, Sao Paulo is a massive uh, city, right? Uh, it is the largest city in Latin America. And uh, it, this small town is where GM headquarters is located to this day. So I, I was uh, born in a, in a city close to it, but I grew up in, in the city called São Caetano, which is uh, belongs to Metro. Sao Paulo is a tiny, tiny city. Uh, especially with, if we compare it to Sao Paulo, the capital city of the state, uh, which is so massive. But we are always in Sao Paulo as it belongs to, to uh, the metro area. So this is where I was born. I went to school there as well as a kid, uh, uh, high school as well, and then went to university for a year before I moved to the States in a city, a city in Metro Sao Paulo area as well for journalism. Gotcha. And and so is that the same uh, Sao Caetano that uh, has the, the famous club uh, that competed yes. in the police uh, made it to the, the final, I think, of Libertadores, sure. right? Sure thing, man. It was. It was. It was wow. like crazy time for us because the city is so small and this team was so untraditional. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was going to some uh, new places that we were not never imagined it would go. And and people in the city uh, actually would uh, support team the support big teams of São Paulo, Santos, Palmeiras, Corinthians, and São Paulo. But we had uh, São Caetano in a very dear place. We mm -hmm. used to go into the stadium uh, to watch it. And it was crazy when it started to go all the way through the final of the Campeonato Brasileiro, the final of the Paulista. It ended up winning the Paulista. And I went to the game, uh, to the final of the Libertadores. I was in the stadium at the time. Wow. It was really disappointing, man. It was so close. It was so, so close. But uh, it, it, and from there, the team went downhill. And it, it is just uh, uh, a 
as it was supposed to be from the beginning, a tiny a team from a tiny city. But that time was crazy, man. Corinthians haven't won the Libertadores at the time. And San Caetano got closer from winning it first. And it was just a, an unbelievable time. We had a lot of fun. Uh, people from the city were, were like delighted with everything that went on. And I'm really glad you remember it. Uh, it is the exact same team uh, from the from that city. Nice. So then, yeah. how did you get into football? What, what uh, where did your love and passion for the game come from? Man, uh, it is really the the most common story as how people get uh, get to love football here in Brazil. Uh, my dad used to love the game, and I grew up with uh, with him taking me to the stadiums. I was five years old the first time he, he took me to Pakenbu Stadium to watch a Santos match, and I, I just fell in love with the, the atmosphere. I mean, for a kid to get in a stadium with your dad by your side, cheering for a team and uh, all the fans uh, going in one direction, this is... Uh, something you cannot forget and you cannot uh, cannot live by without this uh, being a huge mark in your life. So this uh, was really important to me. I remember this as it was yesterday, and uh, this is when I, I start I start loving the game and and following it with more passion, watching it with my dad and follow, following the, the tournaments and following. Uh, uh, all all the teams and, and learning the history of the game. I always uh, liked history, so I, I like to connect both things. And I, I to to this day, I try to put a little bit of that within within my my broadcasts when I'm talking about the games, which is bringing a little bit of the history behind of it and the importance that the game has for the city and for the country. And uh, so since I was a kid, this is something that brought Pat, that, that I had like a lot of passion towards. And uh, so I, I started loving it. And, and of course, uh, I love the sport in general, but having a team is, is something that pushes you forward to love it even more. And Santos in my life was something really, really important. And it still is. Uh, we, I'm a, I'm a sports journalist. I try to be uh, professional, and, and I think I, I do a good job with that because I love the game. But it is important in my view to to actually be a good uh, sports journalist if you don't support any team because you gotta have a background, and you you take and you build this background by loving the game and loving the team. So that's. Uh, pretty much what happened to me, and this is the pretty standard story for people that love the game. That started watching it with family, in this case, my dad, my my mom's side of the family. They were all Palmeiras supporters, and uh, my grandpa, he was from Italy, and uh, he, he really tried to push me through and 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 for for me to support Palmeiras. But my dad ended up winning the battle. And I became a Santos fan at the time. So that was pretty much it. And, and career-wise, it was a pretty easy decision for me for the, the, the way I love the game to, to continue following it in, in other directions of my life. That's very cool. And yeah, you talked about a bunch of things. And be before you said about uh, Sao Caetano reaching the Copa Libertadores final, I believe that was against Olympia, which is not it like was. historically that's been winning things a lot uh, when it comes to South America. Obviously, you have Brazil and Argentina, but still 2002, a legendary year for the national team. And it would have been even better if Sao Caetano managed to win that. And moving on to your life, uh, you talked a little bit of uh, living not only in Brazil, but also in the U.S. And was curious, when did you come to the United States and what was it like for you moving to a different country, different society? Did you have any language barriers or anything like that? Sure, sure. But, uh, talking about that, I mean, as I told you guys, uh, the city I was from was, it was GM headquarters. 
And that was, was where my dad used to work at the time. My dad has been working for the auto industry for 45 plus years. Uh, so all his life has been part of it. And uh, at a time, it was back in 2009. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, we had the opportunity as a family to move to the U.S. and leave the headquarters of a GM in Brazil to the headquarters of GM in the U.S. So we moved to Rochester, which you guys know really well. Uh, and it was really close to Detroit. And uh, it was a huge uh, shift in our lives. I've been working, I've been studying journalism for a year. I was able to transfer it to Oakland University at the time. And uh, man, I hold Detroit and Michigan really dearly in my life to this day. And also uh, as my family, we love this time of our life and we cherish it a lot. All the experiences, all the learning, all that, uh, all that we were able to grow as a family and uh, all the things we had to overcome together. But it was great, man. I, I love the city. I love the state. I, I really um, were able to, to experience all of that. I love sports in general, so I became a huge Lions fan as well. I, so the, it, it continues to be terrible to this day. To, to be a Lions fan. And I think I, I have to, uh, at a point of my life, I had to decide, will I be a Santos fan or a Lions fan? Because both, this is impossible. Mentally speaking, it is way too hard. So, but at the time I, I used to go to Ford Field a lot. I worked at NBC for a while, WDIV, and I was able to cover some high school football games at Fort Field, and man, it was a great opportunity in my life. I have Michigan and Detroit in a very dear place. I have a tattoo, man. I showed Henry a while ago, and that's the spirit of Detroit. I I, I don't know if you can see it, and uh, it is pretty similar to the one Peter has in his uh, uh, Rudy right there, right there. And the, this is how uh, Detroit is important to me. It was a great time. I three I spent three years there and I wanted to come back to Brazil at the time. I don't regret it. It is my country. It is my country uh, culture. All my family is in here. Um, all my friends are in here. But man, I left a whole lot of friends and a whole lot of experience right there in, in Michigan. So uh, I really want to come back to visit really soon. Uh, maybe meet you guys in person, but this is a very important part of my life. The three years I spent in Detroit, in Rochester, studying at Oakland University, it, it has a huge amount of importance in my life until this day. So I hold this in a very dear place in my heart, for sure. Yeah, definitely. You have to come back at some point and meet with us, not only through the camera, but also in person, as you said, it would be actually cool. And one of the things that surprised me a lot was the fact that you went to Oakland University and we shared a little bit of a time frame with each other, despite not sure. knowing who you were at that time. So I think you said that you went to OU between 2019 and 2021. I graduated in 2022. So there were two years in there, uh, maybe during COVID, which still would have been hard to meet. But I really regret not knowing you before that. So tell me a little bit about the uh, experience at OU and did you decide to major in journalism because you like sports overall or was it because you had done something prior when you were in Brazil at that before that point? I think uh, I at the time we were talking about going back and forth with matches, messages. I wasn't that clear because I went to OU uh, back in 2009 has been a long time ago. So I, I left, I, I graduated in 2011. So it's been like 10 plus years that that happened. And I left Michigan in 2012. So it's been a while. I don't think we, unfortunately, we didn't share that time frame. But, but man, OU was really important for me. I mean, I grew up as a person and as a, a the professional a whole lot because the, the the 
the things I had to put myself through, it, it was really hard. And uh, at the same time, it made me to it made me grow up a lot. So it was the first time I left the country. And uh, straight up, I had to go to an American university. And so it was uh, really intense for me to, at the beginning, to learn uh, what well, I was going to have to go through to get my degree and to graduate. And, I lit and little by little, I think I was able to overcome it and uh, take the, the best advantage I could, take the best experiences possible from the university. And uh, to, to answer your, your question, Enric, I think uh, I went to journalism I, I finished high school and I went to uh, a journalism university in Brazil for a year before I moved to, to Michigan. So I was able to transfer my credits and continue this path I uh, already had uh, started back then in Brazil. So uh, this was pretty much the, the, the time frame I, I had uh, gone to, uh, took some credits in Brazil was able to transfer then, took the TOEFL. The, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, it is an English proficient test. Uh, so back then it was uh, something we needed to take to, to uh, be accepted at the school at a time. I was able to pass it and I began my path to get my journalism degree at OU. A very special and important time in my life for sure. Uh, I, I took, uh, I got accustomed to it, but at the beginning it was really uh, tough to overcome the language barrier because I, I, I was new to how to speak English. I went to uh, some English, took some English courses since I was a kid. Uh, my dad working at GM, he knew how important it was to, to speak English, to know the language. So since I was a kid, I was, uh, I've been taking some courses, but being there and, and going full on into the university experience, that was hard, man. And that was totally different. Uh, but I I, it, it, I didn't take that long to get accustomed to it and, and actually try to go through and take uh, the the whole experience as, as good as I could. So it was an important time and a special time in my life. And I, I think not only for school, I went to OU, I, I also went to Spex Howard School of Media Arts. I don't know if you heard of it. It was a, 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 a broadcast school in Michigan at a time at Southfield, at a time close to Detroit. So I also went there and uh, uh, so the, the learning experience right there uh, down in Michigan, it was great and very important for me as a professional right now. That's very nice. And you talked earlier about uh, DCFC, you having a tattoo on your arm. So did you go to Detroit City FC games a lot during your time here? Or was it something that maybe you had to do it maybe once in a while, but not too often? Man, I really wish I had more opportunities to do that. But it was at the very beginning of the CFC. They were establishing themselves at the time. And I knew it was happening. And I, I went to a game. I went to a single game uh, at the very beginning of it. But I, wa I was also, I was always thinking of how soccer could uh, uh, have a major uh, space within Michigan sports as uh, Detroit, as the Lions had and the Pistons had and the Red Wings had. I, I, I always think, I thought Detroit needs a team in the MLS or in another division. And I, I saw the very beginning of uh, the CFC at a time. I, I wish I had the opportunity to see it grow and even more, but I left the country at a time. I've been following it uh, through the internet uh, being, uh, I see it is growing. I see they have a very, very passionate fan base right now, which I think it's amazing uh, to see. So this is uh, something that I didn't have the opportunity to uh, follow 
and to experience the way I wanted at the time. But man, I'm proud of the team and I, I really hope they uh, keep on growing and advancing. And I, I really want to have the opportunity as I visit Michigan and you guys to join uh, to watch a game with you. It would be great. It really would be great. And and yeah, I, I, I really hope that you could get back because the, the environment, the stadium, it's so much better than when you were here. Probably they were playing at Cast Tech at the time, you know, having yeah. the, the, the stadium to themselves and just the environment, the pre-match environment. It's, it's really great. And, and I think it, it would surprise a lot of people maybe that are listening that um, might brush off any sort of uh, supporter culture in the U.S., uh, but the DCFC really has a great, a great history and uh, albeit short, but it's a, uh, it's a great environment. And yeah, and if, when you come back, we, we got to go to a game. So yeah, excellent, man. It's going to happen because sometimes I dream that I'm visiting Michigan and I, uh, seeing my friends, seeing the places that were important to me at a time and be sure that this is one of the experiences I, I really want to have really, really soon. And at the hey. same time, man, you guys, you both of you need to come to Brazil and we, uh, I'll take you to Villa Belmiro to watch a Santos match. This is, this gotta happen, man. I'll be honored to. We would love to. Yeah, it's our dream. And we talk about Santos almost every week, despite not being a good situation at the moment. So it's our dream club. And yeah, we would be very honored to visit the Villa Belmiro at some point. And you said that, You've gone to Brazil, United States, but before we keep going and talk about journalism and your other experiences, I saw some pictures on your Instagram related to visiting Chile and Patagonia. And what was that like? Was that a journey that you just took with your friends or were you by yourself at that point? And why did you do that at that time? At that time? I've been uh, to Peru and uh, Patagonia in Argentina and uh, my friends are kind of crazy, and uh, they decided to go up the, the huge hills of Fitzroy in Argentina. And I don't know why I said yes, but I did. But it was a great experience, man. I love Argentina. It is a place that if you visit Brazil, I would uh, make a way to go to Argentina as well because it, it is great there. People is amazing and uh it is hard to go all the way to Patagonia because the distance are huge in South America. But we had a, a great time. It was before COVID. So we didn't know what it was going to happen. It was a little prior to it, but it was quite the experience. And the one I, I uh, at Peru, man, we went all the way to the Inca Trail, all the way to the the, the a city called Ole Tambo at, at Peru to uh, Machu Picchu. So we made all uh, the, 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 the trail by feet. We spent four days walking in the middle of the, 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 the forest and uh, went in up and down hills for four days straight to get to Machu Picchu. And it was crazy, but amazing experience I had at the time with a couple of friends as well. One of my, two of my best friends to this day. So uh, South America is great. I mean, not only Brazil, Brazil has a lot to show, but traveling around the continent, man, there's so much to see and so many uh, different types of opportunities and experiences you got to embrace and South American people, Latin American people in general are very warm and very embracing. So having the opportunity to uh, meet other types of cultures, but see the similarities from the one you have in your country and uh, the way that people are in a different way, but in a similar way at the same time, it is simply amazing, man. And I had a beautiful time. I've been to Uruguay as well in South America. I had the, uh, I really uh, wish I had the chance to go to Chile because people say it's also amazing. But 
that uh, distances are uh, something that uh, is it is kind of hard to, to overcome. So you got to take planes. Uh, it isn't like Europe that you can take buses or trains, which is uh, coming going from the city to the other. It is so much easier because the difference, the distance are shorter in South America, man. It is just way too large. So it takes uh, a whole lot of planning. Uh, the financial aspect of it also takes a toll. And this translates to football, to soccer as well. Uh, we are having the, the unified game in both Libertadores and Sulamericana right now in a single stadium. This year, it is going to be a Maracanã Stadium once again. And I don't, still don't think it is a, gr a great idea until this day because of the distances, because of the, the cultural aspect of football in South America is way different than it is in Europe. And the, we are, uh, South American football is trying to uh, copy the system that they have at the Champions League and the European leagues and translate it to, to our continent. But man, it is a different situation, you know? And this is what I don't agree with. Because of distances, because of the financial aspects of the population. So uh, it is really hard to overcome those. And uh, that's uh, something I don't agree with. But man, if you have the opportunity to come to South America, I really, really, really recommend a trip to Argentina, to Peru, to Uruguay. Uh, people there are simply amazing. A whole lot to see as well. Yeah, and I understand your point of view, and especially not only Brazil, but other South American or countries. We view them as foreigners, as uh, nationalities related to football, because when we think of Argentina, we have to think of Messi and uh, and the national team and everything the same thing goes for Uruguay Chile but it's a whole different story because it's a different level of talking about the sport and the culture of the people which you talked about and it's always nice to have that now going back to journalism journalism experiences that you talked about us earlier uh, you worked in, as an editor for ESPN in 2016 until 2017 you worked at Globo until 2018, Claro 2021 and 2022. And people maybe, uh, people who watch Brazilian league or, or Brazilian sports through Brazilian channels are aware of those because they always pop up uh, during mid-matches as advertisements. So what were some of your things that you liked and did not like specifically from each of those experiences? Man, I... Coming back from the States, I, I, I worked with sports there uh, at, at WDAV, as I told you guys, uh, with uh, high school football. And I knew I wanted to continue to work with uh, sports in Brazil related to journalism. When I came back, I went uh, through a different path for a little bit. Uh, I decided to go into communications instead of journalism. And this is something that I regret a little bit, but at the time, I mean, it is life. You, you gotta make some mistakes to learn and overcome them. And uh, I spent a couple of years working with communications before I actually decided to leave it behind and go pursue what I really wanted to work with, which is sports journalism. And uh, I had uh, many opportunities. Uh, two of them were the most important ones, the ones you just mentioned at ESPN and at Global. Those were really important. Those really uh, helped me develop as a better professional in, in my career. And uh, those uh, Global is really, really important in the history of uh, sports in Brazil, especially football. This is the, the, one of the largest broadcast channels in, in the, the, the planet. It is really, really big. And uh, if you think of football in Brazil, teams in Northeastern Brazil very often support teams from Rio de Janeiro, 
Flamengo, Vasco, Fluminense, Botafogo. And why is that? It is because Globo is a, a broadcaster from Rio that used to broadcast uh, games from Rio throughout the entire country. So it is really, really common for you to go to Northeastern Brazil, North Brazil, and meet people that uh, support Flamengo, for example, or Vasco. So uh, this is how big Globo is at a time. And uh, ESPN is a newer uh, channel in Brazil, uh, but the experience there was really, really intense. They took journalism really, really serious there. And I was able to uh, perform and, and work in, in coverages uh, that really stuck to my mind. And I really lo love remembering about then uh, all the passion and all the, the, the aspects of uh, a prof at, a, at the professional and emotional level of, of sport which is really, really hard to take apart one from, from the other. And I was able to balance those out uh, at my time at ESPN. And those were great. Those were really, really important to me. I was able to meet some of the guys that still work with us uh, to this day with the Brasileiro play at the time, especially at Globo. I don't know, Vito Brazil, I, you might have heard of him. He, he, do some, he does some games with us as well. And also John Katko. He is very often with us there. They used to work at Globo at the time. So I, I knew then from that time, great guys, amazing guys. And uh, uh, it was such a great experience, both of them, in fact. Uh, the, the, the toughest and the, the, the hardest aspect to to it is the situation that journalism has been having, not only in Brazil, but throughout the world, uh, the financial aspect of it and the downsizing of operations really are, are really overcoming uh, what we wanted to uh, have as a professional, as a profession itself, as a way to develop uh, your career. Uh, so, and this is a, something that is going on throughout the planet and uh, we just gotta adapt to it, but it's still a, it's still a pretty hard path for people uh, getting their degrees in journalism right now to uh, go uh, to understand how different medias are really uh, taking over and uh, so we are we are living in a, a transition in time uh, regarding that. So it is really hard uh, sometimes to understand the balance between because when I was a kid, TV was the thing, the major thing. So for my parents and for my older friends, uh, talking about uh, being at global. It was the, the, the top of uh, anyone, any career, uh, any journalism career at the time, but it wasn't the story and it wasn't the reality uh, for me no more because of the transition between medias, uh, the internet took over and I, I really understand this is a good thing, but uh, balancing things out at a time is still a, a little challenging to say the least, uh, and especially for those getting their degrees right now in journalism. So uh, this is what this indeed was the hardest aspect of those experiences. Nice, and I like how you transitioned from global experiences to Brasilia Royal Play, which is what we're going to be talking about next. So, how did you find this opportunity, and how did you begin working for Brasilia Royal Play overall? It's, uh, it is my third uh, season. Uh, I mean, uh, time goes by really fast, man. It was COVID. Uh, COVID was still uh, a, a thing at a time. And I was living with my family. My dad has a little camp house really close to Sao Paulo, an hour away from it. So we were getting as far away as possible from the big city due to COVID. 
And uh, at a time, Brazil at Home play became a thing and they were uh, trying to recruit people that uh, knew how to speak English and uh, knew football. Uh, and I, I, I thought I, was, I had a shot. Friend, a friend of mine uh, really set me up to an interview and I uh, ended up interviewing with Ricardo Romani, with which uh, you might heard heard of a great guy. I worked with him at ESPN. Uh, so we, uh, I remember we did a mock game at a time, a Sao Paulo game, Sao Paulo and Flamengo game. Uh, and uh, I passed. I, I got the opportunity to start working with them. And since the beginning, man, it was a great experience because the guys, they are simply amazing. I really like those, those uh, all of them. I mean, uh, Mauricio Destri is great. Uh, Anthony Wells, uh, Charles Mills. He's also get great. Lazzarini, he's amazing. So the, the people work that you end up, and Ferrantini, Marcelo Ferrantini, he's the greatest man. He's amazing. So those those guys that you ended up end up spending a whole lot of time with, and uh, they are quite the crew. So this makes everything easier. Uh, to work with them, and the 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 they really enrich the experience having the, the opportunity to do something that we love and and I love and I know that they love as well and uh, we try to make uh, easier for each other so it has been seen uh, like that since the beginning so uh, getting uh, this experience and starting with that uh, this point was really uh, easy but you take some time to get the grasp of the game in English because you play FIFA and you watch uh, games in English sometimes from the Premier League, but you are really used to see football in Portuguese, you know. And uh, I knew how to speak English at the time, but getting the terms and get the terminology and getting the pace of the game in English, it is uh, an experience that takes a while for you to to get and, and perfect. So. Uh, it has been three seasons, and I, I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun. Schedule-wise, this can be tough sometimes because uh, we have a whole lot of games, games through the weekends and uh, Wednesday, uh, late, late Wednesdays as well and Thursdays, but uh, it pays off, man. It pays off a whole lot because uh, those are two things that I really love, talking in English and having this, this – uh, the opportunity to put in practice all that I learned in the U.S. with journalism and football and soccer, getting those two things together, man, this is a privilege to me to have this experience. And I always do this uh, with a lot of passion, with a lot of preparation and study. Uh, I, I take it, I try to take it really, really seriously, not only because of the professional aspect, of the broadcast which is is great and we are supposed to deliver a great product and we try to work our best and get prepared to do just that but not only that but because i love it man it, it is a great moment in my career because i'm doing something that i really appreciate doing and i when games end uh i i really feel privileged to to have those of the, these opportunities to be working with something that I really, really like. So it has been great, man. It is the third season. I really hope there's more up ahead for us to continue to uh, do the Brasileirão. I love the Brasileirão as a tournament. I really believe this is a very, very competitive league. league. So working with it is uh, intense, uh, which I uh, the toughest... Uh, the, the most challenging aspect of it is seeing the situation Santos is in right now. So, because it doesn't get any better, man. It has been three years, and I, I never saw Santos trying getting closer from a better path uh, since then. So, I really, really hope 
to have a season that Santos flies a little bit higher. And uh, we were you were talking about that. I think we have a shot on on avoiding relegation, but it is going to be tough. It's going to be a really really tough year, man. Yeah, absolutely, and and we're gonna get to to kind of Santos and 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 the the current Sorry, situation. I think I'm, 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 no, 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 it's great. I I, we'll, we'll we'll get there, uh, and the current situation in the rest of the hours as a whole. Uh, but before we do, I just want to uh, pivot back to the um, uh, your experience as a commentator. Um, you know, I, I'm just I, I always am thinking, you know, how I'm putting myself in these situations and. Uh, you know, I would be a nervous wreck, uh, especially live on air. Are you nervous when you're commentating? Are you hyper conscious about making mistakes? Um, you know, if you do make a mistake, how do you kind of uh, walk around that? Um, and have you ever had moments, you know, where you're you're thinking you're playing it back through your mind and you're thinking, oh, why did I say that? Man, uh, you know, it does happen. It does happen. This is a good question because. Thinking back, I used to make more mistakes, but those were regard regarding to to the, to language, to English, uh, not the content I was talking about. Because as a journalist, I I always had it back at the back of my, my mind that I had to be certain uh, with what I was uh, going to say before saying it. I always had that sense of responsibility with. The things I was saying, so I used to study um, a, a lot before the games to talk about the teams, and it doesn't avoid some mistakes regarding the content. I, as I am a journalism a journalist, I always had that sense of responsibility with what I was going to say. So I always make sure I was going to, I was saying the right information and not going straight with the things I had in my in my mind even though I was certain I was certain about some things I always research and make sure and this is something that goes through the back of my mind due to my journalism background and uh, something that I am pretty used to uh, but I have not a hard time going back when I, I knew I made a mistake and uh, correcting myself because it, it's uh, part of the game you you got to do it and i think it is uh, more sincere when i make a mistake and go back and correct myself this uh, really makes people think that i'm i'm taking it seriously uh, when i do that and we are going to we are going to make some mistakes from time to time it happens but we always try to uh, really be professional and uh, study before the games and knowing what we were talking about. We really t take that really seriously, not only me, but all the guys. We uh, really uh, take it with a lot of responsibility, but mistakes are going to happen, man, especially with the, the language. I, I think my English has been a little bit rusty. It has been a, a, a long time. I left the, the U.S. and I, I, I know I'm, I'm going to make some mistakes and that's fine. I, I think I can go around it. But I'm not that nervous anymore when I start matches. I used to be at the beginning because it, it was a new thing. But I, I know I will be able to go around when I forget a word or a terminology, and I will be uh, more often than not to be able to be understood at the end of the day and uh, really bring the message that I want to bring to the fans watching the game. So this is uh, what I really, really try to do. And I sometimes in big games, you got the butterfly in the stomach feeling, but this is a good thing, you know? I appreciate those. Uh, uh, last Saturday, I had my first uh, Corinthians and Palmeiras in those three seasons. And those are great, man. Those are um, a huge, especially being from Sao Paulo, watching that rivalry through the 90s. Uh, I mean, this is a huge thing. So I, I took that really, really seriously. But it ended up being great. 
And I had a great time alongside Anthony Wells, and we had a, a really, really good broadcast. So this is pretty much it. I still have, uh, uh, I still feel, feel nervous sometimes, but not nothing that holds me back. I, 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 I know I can do there and, and, and give my best. And this is enough for me, in my view, you know. Yeah, I totally understand where you're coming from, especially when having maybe difficulties, especially living in Brazil. Uh, maybe not many people speak the language. So at least while you're working for Brasilia Raw Play, you have a chance to talk in English with other colleagues. So it's always good to do that. And moving on to Santos. Eric, your English is way better than mine, man. So <laughs> you 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 cannot you you cannot say that you cannot it is not up to debate you know <laughs> your English way better than mine so <laughs> I mean I, I think you, I told you that I'm Albanian so I had difficulties sure. just like you in the beginning when I came to the United States and I still do and I still don't think I'm perfect Peter is probably the best especially in the weekly episode and you kind of are aware of that so. It's always nice to speak with you guys in English. And yeah, it's 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 really cool because I constantly talk in the, in the English language and it helps me learn something new every day. Sure, and, man, but you do great. You do really, really great. Your English is perfect, man. Thank you, man. Yes. Going back to Santos that you talked about a little in the beginning, you said that you started supporting the team uh, very early and you attended matches with your dad. You went to Villa Belmiro a lot. So it was just a little curious. When was the last time you went to the stadium? And what are some of your best memories at the club? And But also the worst ones. Okay. Okay. Uh, my experience with the team, man, I I, I remember that the, the first time I saw Santos at the stadium, I mentioned to you, uh, I was five years old. It was at the quarter of finals of the Brazilian of 1995. Santos went all the way to the final that year. They lost to Botafogo. It was the last time that Botafogo actually won the Brazilian. It was back in 1995. They're about to, they are gonna win the Brazilian. It, it, it is uh, pretty much impossible for them to lose this year. I like Botafogo. I have nothing against that. But it was the first time that I actually realized that being a Santos fan is hard for many reasons, <laughs> you know, because uh, you have a, a whole lot of passion involved and a whole lot of, of history involved, not only because of Pelé, but because of everything the team has been through and the importance that Santos has uh, nation uh, for, for Brazil itself, being a banner of Brazil, uh, abroad and uh, Santos has been uh, that for a long time not only because of the lab but that and being uh, part of develop some uh, so some great new players every single year or every uh, one or two years and we are seeing this to this day we saw the Brazilian uh, team uh, we saw the Brazilian uh, national team game yesterday against Bolivia and Neymar and Rodrigo scored and you you think where did they come from and you know it is a huge sense of honor to see them coming from Santos them being Meninos da Vila which are, are Santos Youth Academy Santos Youth System and I uh, because of my dad I, I also had uh, Santos in a really high place in my life and I always deep down when uh, I, I was I tried to learn uh, the, the history of the team deep down and, and, and how it became what it was but man I've, I've, I've been through some really really tough moments uh, when I was a kid since 1995 when I started uh, following football I it took a while for me to to for Santos to bring me some happiness. It took a while. I remember uh, it, the first time I actually uh, saw Santos win something, it was back in tw uh, 2002 when Robinho, Diego, Fabio Costa, they won the Brazilian round back at the time. And man, it was an unbelievable feeling, feeling. And I hold that 
that uh, moment really dearly in my life. Uh, it is unforgettable to see uh, your team winning it for the first time in your life. So I, I always remember that with a lot of passion, but uh, football is, is hard, man. It is the greatest sport of all time in my view because it, it, it really it is a huge mix of feelings that you had you you gotta learn to deal with because i mean the situation Santos is right now it is something that is always here in my head throughout the day you know it never goes away i'm always thinking a little bit about that thinking man are we gonna avoid relegation it is the first year we are going to the city big because Santos has never been relegated. So it is something that we are really, really, really proud of. And uh, I mean, I'm really worried about that. And uh, it, it has been since that uh, throughout all my life and, and having this as a, a, a main reason for being worried about, you know, uh, but I, I, I had great experiences, man. I remember the first time I went to Villa Belmiro. Uh, from the city I'm from, you take a road, uh, uh, a freeway, and you you are at the beach in like 45, 50 minutes. So it, it was really easy for me to go to Villa Belmiro, and I used to go there very often. I went, the last time I went there, it was at the at the Paulista State Championship, and I had tickets to see Santos and Flamengo uh, to the Brasileirão this year. But uh, you remember that game against Corinthians when Santos fans threw fireworks at the the pitch yeah. and the yeah. mm -hmm. was close. It was the game right prior to it, so uh, I, I couldn't go to the game after that. But man, that moment in 20, uh, I, I went back and forth uh, because talking about Santos it is a huge uh, amount of feelings that I, 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 I try to describe. Uh, it, is, it is something really important in my life, but those moments are really important. The, that tournament, that 2002, uh, uh, Brazilian title, the one in 2004, also really, really important. And of course, uh, when Neymar took over, man, it was, I was living at the States at the time and I, it was hard for me to be far away at that time because Santos was so good, so amazing. And I couldn't see it in person, but I, I was able to see Neymar at the pitch with Santos when I, went back to Brazil back in 2012. I went to many Santos games because I, I, I thought, okay, I was far away from it and I got to be present. I got to see it with my own eyes. So I was, I was able to watch Santos with Neymar and that was also a marvelous time. And uh, we knew what he was going to become, you know? And uh, watching that kid play with Santos, with Santos jersey, Watching him becoming the second best uh, player of in the centennial history of Santos, right after the king of football, it was uh, 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 an amazing thing to witness. Witness. I think he has made uh, some uh, mistakes throughout his career since he left the team, and I, I thought that he could have been way bigger. Than he already is, and he's an amazing player. I love Neymar to this day, but I, I think he could have become really even bigger than he is right now. But I, I'm really, really hopeful to see him wearing Santos jersey once again in the future. Come back to Brazil, choose Santos, and uh, I, I really hope that moment to, to become rea a reality. So watching him play for Santos was, was also a great experience. I don't know if I, I was able to answer it the, the best way. No, definitely, definitely answered it. And, and yeah, I mean, just, I really hope so. In fact, Enric and I, we, when we were on earlier, uh, just before you joined, we were talking about exactly that, um, uh, whether Neymar is going to come back. Hopefully he does. 
uh, when it's going to happen and, and, and some of the, his career moves that we've, uh, we talked about, but yeah, just, and, and that whole time period, like you said, was so iconic and they did the most genius thing was they, like you said, everyone knew in the moment how great they were and how great Neymar was. And they really did a great job on their YouTube channel at the time, which allowed someone like me or Enric, you know, I, I had no access to Rusty the Row at the time. And that's how I really followed, you know, looking at results on Wikipedia and looking at the behind the scenes um, videos that they would always put up. Uh, and that's how I learned all the players and all that. It's just it, just a genius move. Uh, but we do have to talk about, we've already danced around and mentioned it directly, the current state of the team. It's it's really a tough situation, as you alluded to. Um, the team is in dire straits, and especially with the recent loss to America, that it's just looking darker and darker with every day. Um, wanted to ask you, you know, where, in your opinion, is the team going wrong? On paper, they have strong players, and they've brought in new signings too. Um, and, and maybe you want to talk about some of their new signings, ones you like, ones you don't. But where are they going wrong? Where what are they getting wrong right now? It's been. It is not a thing of the present moment. Uh, it has been. Things has been through a tough, really tough patch through at least three years. And one thing that uh, I'm gonna say that really blows my mind if I think about that is that Santos has not been able to qualify at Sao Paulo State uh, Championship through, through the knockout round, which is something that all four teams of Sao Paulo sh should do. It is quite an obligation. Santos has not been able to qualify to the knockout round for three years in a row. And this tells me a lot. It is a miracle that Santos has uh, not been relegated in the Brasileirão so far. And uh, those mistakes are following Santos since this new president took over. And uh, he's, uh, he thinks about, uh, he thinks and he talks about uh, the, as the financial aspect of the team and how he's trying to set uh, things in the right path financially wise, but football is not all uh, not only about money. And we know Santos was in a really, really tough place to be financial wise, and this should be corrected. But man, you gotta know that the history of the team needs to be protected. And uh, you gotta take really smart steps to do that. We are talking about Santos Football Club. This is one of the greatest teams in the history of the game. And you got to do everything to protect the brand and protect this history. And I don't think that Hueda, the current president of the Santos, of, of Santos has been doing a great job since he took over. Uh, not great names have been joining the team. And uh, we are playing like a smaller side, you know. And we are hiring and signing players as a smaller side. And uh, coaching-wise, Santos has made uh, many mistakes uh, since Hueda took over as well. Uh, we can talk about maybe Paulo Tuja. He has uh, been really bad. Uh, Odai Hellman did a terrible job at the beginning of the season. I think uh, Diego Aguirre can correct some things, but I don't think that Santos had... Uh, a, a really great transfer window. Uh, this worries me a lot because uh, defense-wise, Santos has some problems. Wingers, Santos has some problems. We have some really good front players in my view. I really like Marcos Leonardo. I think Soteldo can uh, uh, overcome some difficulties and uh, once again start to do uh, to play well. But we have some really uh, great problems all around regarding players because Brasileirão is such a competitive tournament and you got to have a decent team to compete every single week. And if you don't, and if you depend only in a single player or in, a, in two or three players, 
those are going to be uh, to get hurt at a time of the season or be way tired and not be able to play and the team is going to to feel the absence of those players. I don't think that Hueda and Santos managers have prepared well for the situation uh, they knew they were going to face this season, this Brasileirão, which is one of the toughest in history. Uh, we always uh, say that uh, through our broadcast, Brasileirão uh, has 20 teams from those uh, 20 teams, 15 Brazilian champions. So the stakes are so high, you know, and, and Santos should be competing in another level. I think, I think, ah, man, it is really tough for me to say it. I think we have a shot on um, staying in the, the Serie A, but man, it's going to be tough until the end. I think we got to uh, be prepared for the worst. Uh, for the worse, if you know what I mean. Uh, situation doesn't look good. Um, it's going to be tough. And uh, Santos has the three following Santos games are key, in my view. Santos is going to face Cruzeiro at Vila Belmiro right now. And we are going to face Bahia at Arena Fontinova. And then we are going to face Vasco at Vila Belmiro. Those three are direct confrontations with teams that are, are also threatened with relegation. And Santos got to win those three games. Not tie, got to win those three games, especially those at Villa Belmiro. This is going to be key for us to stay at the elite for the upcoming season. I think Santos can manage it, not only because of the players and, and the coaches, but because of the fan base that are going to the Villa Belmiro, Santos supporters are great, especially there at the stadium. The atmosphere uh, really pushes the team forward and has been pushing the team forwards historically. So this is going to be another opportunity for Santos fans and Santos huge fan base to push the team forward and win games when it, it is mo most needed. I've seen those fans uh, pushing the team in better situations, you know, but this is also the time that I know the the, the very faithful, faithful Santos fan base will be there to push the team forward and support the team uh, throughout a better path into the tournament. And I'm really hopeful, but really, it is a really scary situation as well. What do you guys think? Well, hopefully we avoid relegation, but me and Peter were talking on the last episode of teams that can potentially be below us. And I said, uh, if there's teams that are going to finish below us, that they have to be America and Coritiba, and then we need two more being either Goyas, uh, Cuiabá, and Bahia. And I think maybe uh, Cuiabá can escape, but Goyas and Bahia need to go down in order for us to escape because Vasco da Gama seems like a team that will be reviving in the coming weeks of the Brasileirão. So hopefully things turn up best for us, but you talked about crucial matches and uh, a couple months ago, actually six months ago, in the Campeonato Paulista, Santos played a very crucial match in, I believe, the second last game of the, of the rounds. Uh, and it was against Ituano. It was a game, a must-win match that we needed to win in order to reach the next stage, which you said we haven't done in recent years. And uh, on top of that, we also needed Botafogo of Sao Paulo to avoid winning against Sao Paulo. And Sao Paulo did a good job. I believe they won 3 or 4-1. But on the other side, Santos loses 3-0. And it's really a shocking result, knowing that the fans have been desperate to achieve such a great result, as you mentioned earlier. So going back to our Instagram DMs, you mentioned that you attended the 2014 Campeonato Paulista final between Santos and Ituano, which I remember really well. And I was watching that live during my time living in Albania and watching those penalty kicks. I still remember the exact feeling how afraid or not afraid, but scared of the, a potential loss would cause to me. And we ended up losing. It was a really damaging moment. So wanted to know uh, what were you going through at that time uh, in the stadium and what were you feeling during the penalty kicks for Santos? Man, I, I was able to get tickets for the first game 
It was a, a double match. I, I the term is the, the return fixture, right? I was able to to be able at the stadium. It was at, at back in Bowie Stadium at the time for the first game, the one that Cicero lost at the penalty. Uh, he had the opportunity to win that match. And I was really hopeful, man, that Santos uh, was going to turn things around and, and win the trophy at the time because Santos has been able to win three recent uh, Campeonato Paulista at the time with Neymar. And uh, uh, Neymar has a crazy statistics in, in, in his career is that while he was playing for Santos, he has never missed a single Sao Paulo State final in his entire career. So I was really accustomed to the situation to, to see Santos winning it. And uh, I really thought that at the time Santos was able to uh, was going to be able to come from behind and, and win against Ituano. Ituano. But penalty shootouts are crazy and uh, anything could happen, you know. I r was really disappointed at the time, but I, I thought that Santos was going to have a great year in the Brasileirão, which also didn't happen. And uh, things started to go downhill from from that that moment. But uh, you know, uh, Ituano has been uh, a nightmare for Santos since then. And uh, not only in that situation, but I mean, uh, Itu, which is the city that Ituano is located, is really close by to São Paulo, and uh, really great people live there but the team has been a nightmare for us man I, and i really really hope that santos is staying the elite for 2024 and ituano don't qualify because <laughs> they have a shot because this is going to be a nightmare to see them fighting in the elite this this has been a nightmare scenario for santos uh, for sure man yeah, and they had they were so close last year as well. Enric and I watched the uh, they played Vasco on the last day, I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, man, that was close. Um, but man, Eduardo, this has been great. Uh, you can't leave. We're gonna end it here in a moment, but you cannot leave without a small prediction. We ask all our guests, <clears throat> but since. I think it's obvious you've already said Botafogo are going to win. It's likely they're going to win. Uh, you've also said the Santos are going to stay up. So those are my two predictions that we usually ask. So I'm going to ask you this because this is a very interesting question and there's a lot of teams that are vying for this spot. Who finishes right after Botafogo? I mean, the teams are piled up very closely. You've got Palmeiras, Gremio, Flamengo. I'm looking... Fluminense, uh, even even Red Bull Bragantino is is in sixth place at thirty six points. Uh, so in in your mind, who's finishing number two? I think Botafogo is going to win it at the end of uh, of the year, but they are, are going to start to go down a little bit right now because mm -hmm. it's really normal for a team that went uh, a team that grabbed so many points. And uh, they were 11 wins at 11 games at home before losing to Flamengo. This is crazy. I mean, and it is really predictable to and really common to to think that Botafogo can go down a little bit. But I think they're still holding uh, the first spot into the table and winning in the end. But in my view, right next to Botafogo, Palmeiras has the best team in the Brazil in Brazil right now. And I not only think that they are going to finish second into the temple, but I also think that they are going to win the Libertadores as well. They are the best team between amongst the four, which is it is really hurtful for me to say because they are huge rivals, you know. And I have many many friends that we mock around, uh, <laughs> and they are Palmeiras uh, fans, so this can take a toll on me as well. But that's fine; it is part of the game. And I, I think Palmeiras has been great. Sabel Ferreira is a great coach. And uh, unfortunately, I live really close by from, from Palmeiras Stadium. So I see all <laughs> the fans crazy all the time. And and I, I really wish 
uh, I was in a different situation. But I think Palmeiras is going to finish second uh, in the Brasileirão, not from uh, uh, not many points away from from Botafogo. This is my predict, and I think Santos is going to stay amongst the elite. This I like prediction. it. I like it a lot, and I we're all. I think Enric and, and I were still optimistic, like you said. Uh, these next few games, and I we said I think on the last two episodes that this period for Santos is so crucial. These games, and we already dropped America. These games, like you said, need to be wins. Three points, nine points total. It's got to happen. But anyways, Eduardo, so great having you. Uh, just really quickly, uh, where can people find your stuff? They can reach me at do.bispo on Instagram. That's du.bispo. You can also reach us uh, between games at... Uh, Brazil they don't play on Twitter. Just reach us and uh, tell from where you guys are watching. We love to receive messages between uh, amongst games and between games. And uh, it is great to see people watching us throughout the entire planet. We have a lot of fun. Guys, it, it has been a great experience talking to you. I had a lot of fun. It was great to meet you guys, uh, not in person, but I really, really we wish we had the opportunity to meet in person real soon in Detroit or in Sao Paulo. Uh, we got to make it happen. And I, I, I would have a great time meeting you guys in person. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And yeah, we're definitely going to try and visit you and Marisa Destry and everybody who we come along with and talk through this podcast. All right, man. I right. really hope that happens. And be sure I'm going to take you to Villa Belmiro. And uh, <laughs> I really want to see a Detroit football game as well with you. Yeah, we'll do the home and home. It'll, it'll be sure. perfect. That All right, Eduardo, great. Thank you so much. And everyone listening, have a great day. <laughs>